We are the space robots. We are here to protect you. We are here to protect you from the terrible secret of space. We are the space robots. We are here to protect you. We are here to protect you from the terrible secret of space. I am the pusher robot. I travel around to find people. We are here to protect you. We are here to protect you from the terrible secret of space. We are the space robots. We are here to protect you. We are here to protect you from the terrible secret of space. We are the space robots. We are here to protect you. We are here to protect you from the terrible secret of space. I am the pusher robot. I travel around to find people. We are here to protect you. We are here to protect you from the terrible secret of space. Space has a terrible power. like oh look at that yeah oh there we go yeah that's that's good that's good shows it I look like I have a flip head I have a black shirt on and it blends with the black background so I'm just a floating head
At first, this looks like a full motion scene to me, but on closer inspection, I think this is a suspended mode scene. When, this, when it's sped up, you can kind of see them swinging, and it has the same backdrop as the other suspended mode scenes. And then there's this weird part. Rick Mastracchio puts out his hand, and he moves forward. Maybe he's using his feet to wedge himself forward somehow, but it doesn't look like it. The floor is smooth. His foot is behind that blue handle that's attached to the floor that he keeps both of his feet under and keeps shuffling back and forth on. He sticks his left hand out, and then he just moves forward. He is Superman. That's how Superman moves forward. He sticks out his arm, and he flies. The extended mode is much quieter than the full motion mode. In full motion mode, you can actually hear the sound of the jet engines, the engines of the airplane. In every single scene of full motion mode, in every segment of the International Space Station, you can hear this loud sound, the sound of the jet engines. You could argue that it's the air conditioning Please, system. Not even an office air conditioner is that loud. And why is there a loud sound in every segment of the International Space Station. That's because no matter how soundproof you make it, you can't filter out all of the sound of the jet engines. An airplane is just too noisy. You can put noise cancelling headphones on, on when you're on a plane and that doesn't stop the sound from getting through. It muffles it. They also use microphones that don't pick up very far away. If you have a look at this scene here, you can see that when the microphone's in the middle, pointing towards the guy in the middle, you can't hear the sound of jet engines as much, but when the microphone goes to the guy on the side, you can hear the sound of jet engines. To, be, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. We only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. Yeah, tell me what it's like to be in space. <laughs> What's it like to be in space? Well, it's, kind of, it's a lot like being in the pool here. Start over here. Uh, Leo Enright from Irish Television. Uh, the, the unmanned spaceflight uh, website has uh, uh, coordinates for the landing that go down to something like five decimal points. Um, I just wanted to confirm with you that, that, those, those, that you do have them have those sort of coordinates. And am I reading those coordinates correctly when I see that it looks as though you've landed within 500 meters of the uh, skirt around the mountain? That, I mean, you're really very close to the mountain at the closer end in the landing ellipse and possibly within striking distance of the phyllosilicate trench. I, can, I can't confirm that. Um, my estimate i'm looking for somebody yes there's somebody in the audience here who has that in the tip of their noggin um we should have soon that estimate last thing anybody wants now is an emergency but like everything else they're ready for that too once the crew are on board if it looks as if they're in danger they get out and head down this tube specially insulated against fire and zigzagging down not to some point out and away from the rocket but to an escape room exactly where you'd think it shouldn't be. Three and a half minutes after they get the warning in the capsule, the crew could be down here in the blast escape room via that 200 foot escape tube, 40 feet below the base of the rocket. They find themselves in a totally rubber room, walls, and floors, and they head for safety through a six-inch steel door. Once they're behind that door, it doesn't matter what comes down this tube behind them. On this side of that door, the rarely seen blast escape room itself, it's totally isolated from everything around it by a series of 24 giant springs underneath the floor and shells all round it of steel, concrete and sand. 
it contains enough food, water and air for 20 people for up to 24 hours. And it's all around the edge. There are these foam rubber shock absorbing seats, as you can see. The room is built to withstand the simultaneous explosion of every drop of fuel on a Saturn V. And in that event, strapped into your shock absorbing seat, if your rocket did blow itself to bits 40 feet above your head, all you'd feel would be a mild rumble from somewhere up there. An inflatable plastic balloon satellite, 100 feet in diameter, tall as a 10-story building, will be sent aloft, folded accordion fashion, inside a 26 and a half inch magnesium container. The latter is mounted in the nose of a three-stage 92-foot Thor Delta rocket. Highlighting one of the nation's proudest days in space, the satellite called Echo-1 will serve as a reflector for radio waves that bounce back to Earth, paving the way for a new kind of worldwide communications. The rocket at Cape Canaveral carries the balloon and 30 pounds of powder, which will turn to gas and inflate it at a height above 1,000 miles. And inflate it at a height above 1,000 miles. And inflate it at a height above 1,000 miles. A pre-dawn blast-off at Cape Canaveral fires a Thor rocket with a sensational payload, a balloon as big as a 13-story building. This canister released from the rocket carries within it an echo balloon satellite, like the one that will reflect signals from space back to Earth when put into orbit next fall. Remarkable cameras carried aloft by the Thor record the brief life of the largest satellite yet as it goes 922 miles into space. The experiment is a complete success. Taking a look at supposed astronaut Scott Kelly wearing a gorilla suit Tony CGI. Now again, clowning around in space with this garbage. We're gonna pack up this phony tux. We're gonna pack up all these cameras, a gorilla suit with that canopy, the guitar with Chris Hadfield, you know, chess boards, the phony baloney ball of earth. I mean all these gadgets and gimmicks where they have whoopee cushions in space. They have Easter eggs, they have these stuffed animals, these toys, and I'm taking a closer look at this, and this is nothing more than mockery. And of course, Pig is the arch enemy of Angry Bird, and Angry Bird had some eggs. And Pig stole the eggs. And don't ask me how I got the eggs on Space Station. The technology, um, and in fact, it's probably just a very easy, convenient cover story. It's like, oh yeah, we keep this gridded blue screen around uh, that happens to look just like uh, essentially something they would use with ORAD virtual set technologies, and we just keep it around so we can throw ping pong balls at it and um, stick them onto, uh, you know, a non-existent. Uh, you know, whatever the excuse is. So water is also very dangerous on the space station because we have a lot of electricity. So we need to ver be very careful not to spill it. That is amazing. <laughs> so I'm curious, because I know you have kids at home, how do you stay close to your kids? Oh, oh wow. wow. <laughs> So, water is also very dangerous on the space station because we have a lot of electricity, so we need to ver be very careful. Not I'm just putting some hot water, squirting it onto my scalp, and I have a mirror here so I can kind of watch what I'm doing. Sometimes the water gets away from you, and you try and catch as much as you can. Uh, Will Moore will install a protective plate over that uh, location uh, that uh, will be flush to the surface. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the solar corona what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. 
And interestingly, National Geographic was one of the prime media to present photographs of astronauts cavorting on the moon. So to summarize, what American citizens are confronted with is this enormous propaganda machine. For example, the U.S. Air Force has the largest movie studios and more equipment in San Bernardino than any studio in Hollywood. And again, run slowly. And once more. There are other examples too. This one is from Apollo 17 during the flag scene. You can see the ping at the top of the frame. In this footage from Apollo 16, we have telltale evidence of a slightly floating or dangling effect at the jump salute location. It's as if the weight is being taken off the astronaut's feet just a second or so too soon. Compare that sequence with an obvious rehearsal rig. The dangling effect is very evident. And here again, from the same mission, Apollo 16, we have an astronaut who is about to get up. Let me give you a hand, he says. Look at it again. The astronaut is getting up with the wire taking the weight. When I was talking with the gentleman from Belcom and, and we were discussing uh, the lie, everything he was telling me was different from what we were being told uh, was the truth. And at one point I asked him, I said, man, you, you guys, you, you lied about a lot, didn't you? And instantly he said, no, we didn't lie about certain things. We lied about everything. None of it was true. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with a TV camera. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. You can also notice how the astronaut yeah. operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. Blue see white bands of major cloud formation across the Earth. This is a segment that they believed wasn't even being recorded, much less suitable for broadcast, for the lens was being zoomed out and the scene was being changed to that of an interior of the astronauts at work 
and apparently the stop button popped back up on the recorder without notice. Here is the diffused work light that they used to see camera controls, but not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Here they remove part of the crescent insert. Finally, the iris is opened up to see the real location of the camera and the very bright and near Earth out the window. Here is the slate for the 19th of July. You're over, but I get a pretty good shot. How's that? Let me get the focus right. One more time. Okay, you're, uh, it's partially covering her over, but I get a pretty good shot. How's that? Let me get the focus right. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Doesn't have it either. The Smithsonian right. doesn't have it. Right. Johnson doesn't right. have it. Right. We we have been unable to, to to track it down. I mean, we don't know uh, where this this telemetry data ended up, and we don't know the what what path it may have taken. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm afraid I can't really give you much of a clue as to as to where this data ended up and whether it, it still exists or not. Let's look at the supposed two images provided from NASA of Jupiter. Here's the problem again: 2016, 2014. What's the difference here? Well, the difference is they added the supposed auroras on the north. I mean, this is nothing but a Christmas tree. Give me a break. Take a look here. I mean, all the clouds are in the same exact position. Just the 2016 image is a bit, I would say, darker. This is a bit lighter in 2014. Here's a side-by-side. -side. I mean, people can't see what's taking place here with NASA. Nothing more than fakery. I mean, give me a break. This is, this is a complete insult if you have a brain in your head. Droppo! Droppo, you rascal, where are you? Good morning, dear. Shima, I can't find Droppo. What's he up to now? Sleeping, Chief. It's just that I haven't been able to sleep these last few nights. I forgot how. 
So I was just practicing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suggest you practice doing your work. Visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? Well, uh, the universe put it there. If you choose, God put it there. Is Maybe it? So I keep digging a little bit deeper. And I finally get underneath this cloud cover here, and a few images pop up. And I say, oh, images, what are they? Well, this is what you got, which I'm sure that looks familiar to you, right? Looks just like the pictures they give us of Mars. So I'm just kind of creeping around here and definitely noticing the same kind of undulation changes and same kind of rock, same kind of dirt. Only thing that's missing is that nice little red tint that they pay somebody $150,000 a year to put on there. Right. Um... Who's orange hum hummer is this? Okay, that looks like a NASA symbol. Well, let's dig a little further because I can't really see anything on here other than it certainly looks like a NASA symbol. And I can't read that. Tried. Cameras set up, tents, ATVs, food. They've been there a while. It's not a one-day trip. Got their antennas set up out in the middle of nowhere in Greenland. Another ATV, a leveling, a leveler equipment. So I'll keep kind of going through here and see if it, what the? <gasps> uh, yeah, so, um, I think I found out where Mars is, guys. It's just uh, about a thousand miles north of me. <laughs> Not quite the distance that NASA says. But I can't find anybody who's in charge of this. They must be hiding behind these rocks. Oh, no, there they are out in front of everybody, just standing there. Lovely. Clown number one, clown number two, and clown number three. This thing's just driving around taking pictures. Unbelievable. Actually, if you ask me, it's quite believable. But what do you think? Are they sending scientists up on ATVs to practice on the rover in a remote island in Greenland? Uh, I doubt that, highly. Math and science were kind of my favorite subject. I didn't really like uh, English in, in reading too much, but I've since grown out of that and I enjoy reading now. And I played a lot of sports. So, and all of that happened in a little town called York, Maine, across the United States from where we're talking to you right now. We're watching it in slow motion. Uh, I'll kind of point those out, but just so you know, be prepared for those. Now, pay close attention to this helium balloon. Oops, did I say that? I meant uh, shuttle. I want you to pay close attention to the launch pad below, and I'm sure you've seen before the roll program that the shuttle goes through or rolls onto its back. So here you see some cameras pointing straight down at the launch pad. During the roll program, the cameras should now be pointed away from the launch pad. You'll see here's the roll program. You'll see the sky changing as it rolls. Now let's see where the cameras are pointed. Well, what do you know? Pointed directly at the launch pad, exactly where it took off from. Just another sign of deception, and we can turn to this camera, and it's still looking directly down straight at the launch pad. What happened to its rolling on the back? So, hopefully you're starting to see and get the feel for what kind of video this will be. I'll be pointing out the errors and you all will become like me and never again see a launch the same way. Many will say this video is proof. Yeah, it's proof alright. Proof that we have all been taken for a ride. Now watch here when we see we're looking at the right side of the ship there. And also in this next scene, we're going to be looking at the right side of the ship. 
Okay, that's the right side. See that black square up high and the shadow is cutting it right down the middle? Shadow is about halfway through the bottom of the orbiter. Until we go back to this view, again, we're on the right side of the ship. There's the black square way up high. There's no shadow at all. Shadow again, moving across the bottom of the orbiter. But again, we saw it wasn't on the other side. Here's another classic jokes on us. Looking at the ISS from 250 miles above the Earth. And now we see what the Earth looks like from six miles above. Hmm, should they look the same? Uh, I don't think so, Tim. But, speaking of Tim, let's watch Tim Peake fake his trip to space. Now remember, that little tip there at the top, that's where the astronauts are supposed to be. In a moment, we'll take a look inside, and we'll have a view from that point. Do you think it matches what we should see? Of course, not a chance. Now as we watch this, do you see the fire coming out of the left side? Where is that fire coming from? Well, I'll explain this shortly, but that is a projection error or a projection miscalculation. So we will watch this again in slow-mo, and please make a note. When I do slow down a video, I want to let you know, so if you look into the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a little slow-mo icon, and that's the way you know that I've slowed something down. Again, we can look at the fire that is coming out of the left side of the rocket, certainly not coming from where it's supposed to be, and it'll slowly kind of disappear as the rocket turns, but I will show you that shortly and why I call that a projection issue. Now, we continue watching Tim Peake and his colleagues and fellow astronauts, Liza Lott and Loda Bull, and they continue on their little flight there. Now, right there, if you looked real carefully, you would have seen the white tip fly out. We're gonna watch this in slow motion again because it is some horseshit. Again, if you just look at this part here, if that is flying, up and out to space, why is it that the items that are falling when they're jettisoned are actually keeping up with the height of it? It's because by this time, the item is going down. Here we are in slow motion. You'll see the white tip has already popped out, and then we got a disappearing act followed by this thing speeding up and doing who knows what before these four things are jettisoned. It is some unadulterated deception, a crazy lie, and yet people believe it. You'll see there, you can still see the tip way down below everything else because everything is falling. Falling into the ocean. Indeed. Watch this again. So you've got your white piece already down below. It's already been separated. The tip where the astronauts are. We've got the disappearing act. Then it flies forward. Then you get the jettison. And what do you know? Deception wrapped up in a pretty little bow. Here we're going to watch it just one more time so you can see right here as we pause it at the disappearing act. Where did everything go? I don't know. Guess they went to orbit or space or something. You know how that goes. And then it comes back. And again, how do you spell deception? N-A-S-A. -A. Here we got uh, the three gentlemen in the tip. Now, see if you follow me here. Remember that that thing took off standing upright and then leaned forward or leaned back, whatever, because then it was going in a straight formation. Now see this little thing that they've got hanging from the ceiling? It's supposed to tell you when they actually hit the uh, zero gravity because it starts floating. Well, how is it hanging that way? Those are the way they sit when they take off. So wouldn't they be faced forward now that the tip has popped off and they're going vertical? Well, one would think so. But uh, you'd be wrong because this is just another example of nonsense. Same thing with the little shadows that are in there, but mostly this thing hanging down, how would it be hanging in that exact formation if that's the way they took off? Another sign of a lie of some bullshit. Sorry to say, NASA lies to everyone. Here in a second, we're going to actually see this uh, craft hit so-called gravity. You'll see that pen jump up and watch where it ends up. Now pay attention to kind of where it's at on the seatbelt there. The part where the ink would be was kind of right up high there under his armpit. So do keep an eye on that little dangly doohickle there. It is going to be important if you look at its location. Um, but it will start acting strange here momentarily. 
as if this whole entire scene is not strange. But uh, we'll be able to see here in a moment what that pen starts doing. It'll start to almost shake violently right about now. So watch this. Whoa, it starts going crazy. Now this next scene, it's going to turn and show uh, Tim Peake here. Now pay attention here. The earth is below them. The black of space is above them, meaning that they're laying kind of the equivalent of their heads on the ground and feet in the sky. So why is the dangle bob hanging straight down? Look how the dangle bob is swinging over there in the distance. Look at the earth out the window. It doesn't make any sense. I'm not that smart, but I'm not that stupid. Now here they are getting ready to enter zero gravity. So we'll be watching the pen and thinking about the lowest it can hang. So right now we see it kind of still in that armpit area. And what's going to happen here is when they do hit the so-called gravity line, I don't know, uh, you're going to see that pen take a jump and then end up lower than it should possibly be able to. There you go. Look how low that is. And low. See that? Paused it there for you. We'll watch it again in slow motion. Of course, these are the little things nobody else notices unless you have problems. Deep, deep problems like yours truly. We have to introduce the concept of free fall. So let's use this model of the Earth. And let's enlist the help of a friend, Patsy. You might know her. Ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't figure out by now, I'm going to be the first man to actually tell you this, that teleportation is officially real. We are live in the ISS, and guess what? Teleportation is real. Let's go back and relook at that clip again. You see? Now watch. Oh, wait, wait, wait. See? This, ladies and gentlemen, should let you know that this is only done through the usage of chroma key. This is chroma key technology. This is green screen or blue screen technology. That's what is being utilized here. This is simply virtual reality that is actually being fed to you. And you're taking this virtual reality, making it the reality. When in fact, all this is is simply just virtual CGI, computer generated images that are simply being utilized to aid with these missions of the ISS. Now, I'm going to make this as short as I can. Anyone that has experience with chroma key or anyone who has experience with virtual reality to better make things work like what you just seen in that video there, how this thing, this thing just magically appeared out of nowhere, this doll, this toy, uh, this, you need, to, you need the aid of either a blue screen or a green screen to successfully make this virtual reality appear nicely and go nice and smooth. Now, this scenery is properly staged. That's something you have to know. Everything is staged. You can't have, you cannot do things like that, what you, what you just seen, that virtual reality. In order for, that, th that, for them to do that scenery, to be like that, it's properly staged. Now, for those that are still skeptical, Let's go to the American side of things and let's see, again, we're still at the ISS, the International Swimming Station. Let's go and see what they have to offer um, and hopefully you will be able to understand exactly um, the, the deal with, with chroma key and feathering and all those kinds of effects. Let's take a look at the American side of things. Now observe this next clip. What you are simply seeing is the usage of CGI and this is 100% proof that this definitely cannot be real. These people cannot be in the space station or so as they claim. Um, when you look at this, I want you to see this man's arm disappear right in front of you as he goes in the corner. You see that? Once again, first of all, you may think that your eyes are simply tricking you or you are probably uh, just seeing things and it's not real, but I'm assuring you right now, this is very real. This is the footage that's been attained from NASA itself so what you are seeing, this is a raw footage that has not been tempered with. This is directly from the so-called ISS, the International Swimming Station. So you decide for yourself. If we have the technology to build the space station and have people go and live in the space station for months and months at a time, and they are there constantly reporting back to Earth the things that they are finding there, then the question is, why go through all this trouble as far as faking the space station itself? 
why go through the trouble of faking these people in space who are supposed to be the astronauts who are in space and have their arms disappear from the screen just like that why have that why go through all that trouble in addition to this let me point out to you that they've done a sloppy job that allowed them to be busted once again so the question is will you trust these people are they trustworthy well I'm not going to make the decision for you but I'll help you understand what you're dealing with if these people can go through all the trouble of faking the moon landing and writing it in the history book saying that they landed on the moon when they didn't go on the moon in addition to this also have the audacity to fake the ISS and fake the people who are in space to the point where their arms disappear off the screen and also at the same time fake teleportation stuff using CGI and all that nonsense the question is will you still trust them well I'll let you be the judge for that Yay or nay, that will be for your own to decide. So this has been something that's been nagging away at me for quite a few weeks now. One of my more recent little obsessions, if you will. Because it's prompted me to start to wonder if in any of the footage of the so-called real spacewalks, or EVAs, extra vehicular activities, in any of the space programs, because I've been wondering if I could actually find a, a singular piece of footage which undeniably shows the astronaut going from inside the craft or space station, being in the artificial atmosphere with inside the cabin, to putting on his spacesuit and having the airlock open and then floating out to the exterior. You would think that this would be a very a simple enough piece of footage to, to find. After all, 2015 marked the 50th anniversary of the first EVAs in history. That's 50 years of spacewalks now. And you, you'd think that there should be copious amounts of, of footage from handheld cameras or, or other cameras showing uncut, unedited, continuous shots of any astronaut going from within the cabin outside into space. So this is what I've been looking for, scouring as much footage from the early Gemini and Russian EVA missions to Apollo to the space shuttle and the then on to the MIR and International Space Station missions and sure enough I can't say that up as of yet I found anything which represents this kind of unedited continuous shot we can find lots of footage taken from outside, showing the astronauts supposedly exiting the hatch. And we can find footage of the astronauts prepping and putting on their suits in what is clearly an air-filled environment. But the question of trying to find something which shows them undeniably going from the interior pressurized cabin out into the vacuum of space, for the life of me, I cannot find this. And again, when we consider how many Hollywood movies incorporate scenes involving the airlock, because just how much danger is involved, and not to mention how much just personal excitement would be experienced on the part of the astronaut getting their first look at um, space from outside the vehicle, it's, it's really hard to comprehend that no one ever considered capturing such a piece of footage. If I were to come across footage that seemed to undeniably show this, it would it'd be really hard to explain it away. It would be a really difficult thing to fake. And that's the whole point. Because if you are familiar with all the kinds of critical observation that has been done on things like the ISS or so many of these other space missions 
involving space bubbles and harnesses and all these very peculiar, peculiar anomalies, it makes a lot of sense. Because obviously the ways that they are having to try and fake the interior shots of the ISS or other any other spacecraft or space station with simulated uh, zero gravity would be quite different from the ways that they fake the outside shots using um, blackout pools and things like this. So going seamlessly from an interior shot in an air-filled cabin to a pool filled with water obviously would pose a whole host of problems. So one thing I found that was very interesting was this sequence showing an episode which I believe occurred on the MERS, the Russian MERS space station. And apparently this was a very harrowing ordeal because there was a malfunction with the airlock. And the astronauts came back in from an EVA and were unable to secure the door all the way and repressurize the cabin. So they were starting to run out of air and it was a bit of a, a panic mode trying to trying to get that figured out and then eventually they came in inside a further interior door and were able to lock it down. But the funny thing is, is that this whole sequence is basically just a dramatic reenactment. We don't we don't actually see the real footage of this event. And you can tell pretty easily that it's a reenactment because of all the camera shots that are focusing directly in on their helmets and and even in the reenactment they're showing that the people inside the space station and people down at mission control um, have cameras inside the airlock who can see you know who are watching what the astronauts are doing so you would think that that the real live footage would be perfectly available from all kinds of angles and would make for a much more um, realistic portrayal of this event so the question is why would they why would they reenact the whole thing if, if instead of just showing the real footage? So by itself, I suppose this whole question might not be a definitive proof all by itself that they are indeed faking these spacewalks and space stations and everything, but I find it to be another very interesting um, example of these kinds of proofs by way of omission, just like we never see astronauts pulling 360s out in space with the handheld camera or or the same thing on the moon they never they never do a 360 and do a panoramic shot hello star wars fans this is flight engineer rick mastracchio of nasa on board the international space station today is a very special day for all of us. <laughs> looks like we're having some communication issues Looks like we're back now. To everyone on Earth from the International Space Station, may the fourth be with you. This pen is floating. How crazy is that? Oops. The real likes you just slide your ass off to your wife and your mother. You don't have to shout, Rob. It's not like I'm an astronaut floating around in outer space. So oh, wait, I am. So is it everything you hoped it would be? It's better. <laughs> I wake up every morning and I just can't believe I'm on this incredible adventure. <laughs> well, most fun is actually waking up every single morning and realizing that I am still here on the space station. Ground control to Major Tom. 
control to Major Tom. Lock your Soyuz hatch and put your helmet on. Ground control to Major Tom. Commencing countdown engines on. Detach from station and may God's love be with you. This is ground control to Major Tom. You've really made the grave. And the papers want to know whose shirts you wear. But it's time to guide the capsule if you dare. This is Major Tom to ground control. Down back to earth and roll. 